section fourteen of flower patch among the hills this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis flower patch among the hills by flora clickman chapter twelve just a little piece of griskin i was reminded of the funeral when i arrived at the valley station one spring morning by the fact that it was the remains who opened the carriage door for me and helped us out with our things he was home for a few days leave looking very smart and upright in his uniform and he saluted even though he permitted himself to smile when i gave him a half-crown telling him to buy himself a wreath the white-painted garden gate had been placed wide open by way of welcome we had left behind us in town weather that called itself the end of march but in reality ought to have been january we arrived at the little cottage to find that the calendar had taken a leap forward for here it was like the end of april on the grey stone walls beside the gate clumps of wallflowers were in bloom masses of pale primrose flowers mixed with those of a rich rose-purple variety only these two sorts had been planted in the chinks of this particular wall i am sure the dear things nodded at us as we entered all over the garden were more wallflowers bursting by the thousand into bloom some beds were a mixture of clear bright yellow flowers combined with the sort that are a deep mahogany looking as though they were made of velvet other beds had a pretty rose-pink variety while on the top of more walls and in corners and patches about the garden were the old-fashioned streaky kinds all aglow with brown and yellow the long bed in front of the porch given over to cowslips oxlips polyanthus auriculas and such like homely flowers was very gay the polyanthus were a delightful medley of claret colour pink brown crimson orange yellow most of them looking as though the edges of their petals had been buttonholed around with silk of a contrasting colour it seemed as though the flowers in this bed fairly tiptoed as we came along the path and stretched their necks as high as ever they could from out of their crinkled leaves to show how remarkably fine they were in the narrow beds under the cottage windows double daffodils made plenty of colour and at the edges were clumps of primroses various shades of pink and crimson these had seeded over into the path with the result that baby primrose plants were coming up cheerily between the rough flagstones the ordinary yellow primrose was starring the grass all about the orchard where wild daffodils were swaying by the hundred the white flowers of the blackthorn were like snowdrifts on the hedges it was so wonderful after the bleak cheerless aspect of town to come upon this world of smiling growing things the soft air sweeping over the hills brought the scent of ploughed fields and newly turned earth of bursting buds and opening blossoms with the ozone of the sea and the salt of the weed that lies on the rocks around the lighthouse in the faraway distance there seemed to be an all-pervading peace that laid hold of one's very soul and yet you could not say it was really quiet for birds were giving rival concerts in every tree and quite a number were devoting their energies to saying insulting things to the newcomers and the small dog who had taken the liberty of encroaching on their ancient heritage they are not sufficiently grateful for the fact that i leave my woods uncut and undisturbed as bird sanctuaries lambs were bleating in the valley meadows the spring gurgled cheerfully outside the gate as it tumbled out of the spout into the pool below we stood in the garden for a moment to take a good breath and drink in as much of the beauty as we could when virginia just touched my arm and looked towards a long belt of trees mostly oak and fir that runs down one side of the garden and orchards linking the larch woods up above us with the birch and hazel coppice down below the coppice where the nightingales sing 
and the tiny wrens and the tomtits build and where the little dormouse lives who comes out from among the undergrowth with no apparent fear when i stand in the woodpath and softly whistle this barricade of trees was originally left standing when the rest of the ground was cleared to screen the house from the winter gales but we have named it the squirrel's highway sure enough as we stood there silent and motionless down came one little bushy tail from the upper woods followed by another probably his wife they leapt from branch to branch and from tree to tree nibbling a young oak shoot here sniffing delicately at a few leaves somewhere else little bright eyes looked down and saw the strangers but they had seen them before and no harm ever resulted only lovely feasts of nuts laid out on the tops of walls so they just ran on down their own highway seeming as light as feathers and leaping and springing with indescribable grace at last they got to the high wall that divides the lower orchard from the birch and hazel coppice and they played along that wall bright spots of ruddy brown against the dark green of the ivy and the purple tone of the swelling birch buds all seemed gaiety and happiness till a third little bushy tail popped up over the wall from the coppice and then there were fireworks indeed i expect they were relations who were not on cordial terms we left them having a whole-hearted hand-to-hand fight which i must say seems a much more satisfactory way of settling a difference than either zepp or submarine methods indoors the table had been laid for tea preparatory to our arrival by mrs widow who as already mentioned is the custodian of the house in my absence she gives an old-world curtsy that is very disarming and says i'm main glad to see you back again miss and i hope you'll find everything to your liking that however is as it may be nevertheless there is something about the way that table is always laid that rejoices my heart even though i might not wish to have my meals set in that pattern every day the large white cloth may not present the glass-like surface of the town laundered tablecloth but at least it is white and like the cottage sheets and towels and pillowcases it holds the scents of the hillside garden where it was hung out to dry and though the creases are somewhat ridgy and insistent and the cloth has been ironed a trifle askew i know several people who would rather have tea off this tablecloth than the most elaborate dinner and the finest napery that london hotels can produce knives and forks are placed with great precision around the table at intervals a cup and saucer and plate beside each the crockery never by any chance matching in the mathematical centre a loaf of farmhouse bread stands on a kitchen plate flanked on one side to the east as it were by a large white jug holding a quart of milk and to the west by the sugar basin the big brown teapot stands at the south pole and a pudding basin of new-laid eggs laid by the widow's own fowls are waiting at the north pole to be cooked a small plate bearing a dinner knife and half a pound of butter which is never put into the proper butter dish is placed at the southwest this is balanced at the southeast by a pot of home-made jam and a tablespoon watercress and lettuce may grace the table though this will be according to the season but summer or winter one feature is never omitted and that is a large kitchen jug full of flowers gathered by mrs widow from her own garden on the day i am writing about the jug had a brave handful of daffodils a few sprays of red ribbies dark brown wallflowers some small ivy with some short-stemmed polyanthus suffocating in the centre of the big bunch and it is wonderful how much you can get crammed into one jug when you try abigail having none of my weak-minded leanings towards the primitive scornfully whisked the whole lot off the table as soon as mrs widow had gone back to her own cottage and relaid it on modern lines 
we did not hurry over the meal virginia got on a lengthy dissertation as to the crying need for fish forks with magnetized prongs that would just draw the bones out of the fish without any preliminary search and scrutiny i suggested a radium tip to the prongs i could think of nothing that seemed more suitable but she said that might demolish fish and all in which case one would get no more personal satisfaction out of the creature than one does when having to eat it with its full complement of bones intact i then ventured a suggestion that forks made like an ordinary magnet would do if the fish were given steel drops in regular doses for a few weeks before being caught so as to get its bones susceptible to the magnet but virginia was very lofty as she always is about my scientific explanations i never heard her solution of the problem because the telegram boy arrived at the moment with a wire for abigail saying that her mother had broken her arm a genuine case this time so she left by the next train bewailing the fact that her mother could not get compensation from any one as she had given up a post of housekeeper but three months before if she had only been in the situation still she could have claimed three hundred pounds a year for life abigail thought provided the arm could only be induced to remain broken some people especially her relatives were always unfortunate she said while others were just the reverse there was a cousin of a friend of hers he had been out of work for a year or so before he got a job and then the very first day he met with an accident at the works and had to have his leg amputated and there he is now a gentleman for life comfortably settled on his compensation her people never had luck like that it did seem hard are you awake virginia's voice lilted up the stairs next morning awake why sleep had been impossible in that cottage for hours past for sheer undiluted racket commend me to two earnest souled girls who get up early and go about with the stealthy tread that creaks every old board in the place and commune with each other in stage whispers that penetrate through every crack in the floor all on the pretext of making the fire we had decided that we could manage very well ourselves without sending for any one to take abigail's place and in order to forestall me the others had got up about cockcrow and then began such a whirligig below that i just lay still and endeavoured to allocate every fresh noise they raked and shovelled at the grate and appeared to be scattering cinders all over the place they broke up applewood twigs with resounding snaps and argued as to the amount required to set the fire going ursula said you ought to put in handfuls till you get a good crackling blaze virginia said that was a childish brainless way of doing it to say nothing of the chance of waste by rights the quantity of twigs employed ought to be strictly in inverse ratio to the quantity of inflammable gas contained in the coal i dare say i should have heard a great deal more as to the way to assess the ignitable quality of coal but fortunately the fire burnt up quickly and they gave their attention to other domestic details they dashed about the brass fender they whacked the black lead brush against the oven door at every turn they set down the zinc pail with a ringing thud and then scoured the hearth with zeal enough to take off half an inch of stone surface they polished the brass fire irons with some concoction of bath brick and salt which they invented on the spot as they couldn't find any metal polish they banged the hearth rug out of doors till the surrounding hills reverberated with the echoes they rinked the carpet sweeper up and down till it made me dizzy to listen and as this was not thorough enough for ursula she also got a short stiff brush and apparently pommeled out any dust that might be under the settle and in other obscure corners they dusted with equal energy and they went off into the kitchen to consult about the breakfast menu while the kettle chose the opportunity to boil all over the fire thereby raising clouds of white ash that settled on everything and they said oh dear just look at it 
finally i heard the white cloth being flapped over the table cups and saucers and plates were chinked and rattled off the dresser knives and forks and spoons jingled on to the table and i knew that breakfast was well under way it was just then that virginia put her head through the staircase door to ask in moderated tones calculated not to disturb me should i still be slumbering was i awake hastily hopping out on to the rug i replied that i was nearly dressed and would be down in a minute no hurry she replied artlessly we've only just come down ourselves and are going to see to breakfast but what i want to know is where do you keep your frying-pan hanging on its proper nail in the kitchen i replied well it isn't there no it isn't on the saucepan shelf either we've hunted everywhere but abigail didn't use it yesterday don't you remember we had boiled eggs and some of that cold ham we brought with us all right we can just as well have eggs again that's true we shan't want bacon with that pork coming for dinner but be quick as the kettle's boiling now oh it's not a bit of trouble whether it was due to the sunshine or to the tonic of the air or to the virtuous feeling that always overtakes those who get up early in the morning and disturb every one else i cannot say but at any rate ursula announced that she intended to start right in immediately after breakfast and give the whole cottage a thorough spring cleaning the domesticities of the morning seemed to have whetted her appetite for such matters and she said she felt she must give the place a dutch turnout and have every shelf and stool and all the pots and pans scrubbed and scoured and tilted out of doors to dry as they do in holland virginia said that she too felt a strong force it might be her subconscious self or she might have a dual personality she couldn't say which within her impelling her to turn the house inside out so i told them to go ahead i'm the last one to discourage any one from doing my work for me i suggested however that for the first day they should confine their attentions to the living rooms downstairs of course the reader of average intellect will wonder what necessity there could be for any such upheaval seeing that the place would obviously have been overhauled before we arrived but this brings me back to mrs widow a worthy body and an honest soul the rector said when he originally recommended her to me all of which was quite true but alas thoroughness in regard to house-cleaning is not her strong point when i first sought her out and broached the subject of the caretaker i was requiring she listened in a non-committal way i stated how much a year i was willing to pay naming an exceptionally good sum and explained that for this money the house must be looked after in my absence and be got quite ready for me whenever i should come down while anything she might do while i was in residence would be paid for as an extra she showed no indecorous haste to secure the appointment she merely said she would talk it over with her married daughter and if she thought any more of it she would let me know a few hours later she came to me and said casually that on second thoughts she didn't mind obliging me no one ever works for you in our village they merely oblige in the interval however the whole village had gone into committee on the subject and every one's advice had been sought and very freely given once more i went through the terms of the agreement and she said she quite understood nevertheless subsequent events led me to believe that she regarded the annual wage in the light of a retaining fee only since most of the work is always left to be done after i arrive when it will have to be paid for as a separate transaction if it is more than abigail can wrestle with at the same time i can truly endorse the rector's tribute to her honesty if i were to strew the floor with sovereigns or diamond rings i know i should find them on the mantelpiece when next i returned and she never annexes anything permanently but the fact that one has a village-wide reputation for honesty need not detract from one's worldly prosperity so long as one can borrow with light-hearted frequency and borrow for indefinite periods too 
mrs widow has reduced borrowing to a fine art but her honesty is demonstrated by the fact that i have never known her decline to return any of my possessions indeed so scrupulous is she that she will bring back the tin of metal polish when it is empty explaining that she was quite sure i wanted it to be used rather than wasted abigail invariably spends the first couple of days at the cottage in skirmishing and reclaiming missing articles knowing all this i was not surprised when i heard the frying-pan was minus i also knew that time would reveal other vacancies had it been july or august the preserving pan a family treasure would have been gone too mrs widow was always very solicitous for its welfare about fruit gathering time she says damp would easily hurt a really good preserving pan so she takes it home with her to keep it dry yet the poor thing will be left to face the winter in my kitchen with never a thought bestowed on its delicate constitution and it is just at jam-making time too that my kitchen scales and weights require the ameliorated atmosphere of mrs widow's cottage my own kitchen with the midsummer sun upon it all day being obviously far too cold and damp for such highly strung bric-a-brac as one pound and half pound weights a town acquaintance once said to virginia i suppose miss clickman goes down to her cottage for poetic and literary inspiration oh dear no was the reply she simply goes down as a mere matter of feminine curiosity to see what is left where do you keep your tea towels ursula began as she prepared to wash up the breakfast things there ought to be a pile in one of the drawers of the kitchen table i said they're not there oh well they'll come back presently while we were speaking a small girl appeared at the side door holding in one hand a basket containing a nice chunk of pork wrapped in one of my tea towels and in the other hand my mincing machine this was mrs widow's grandchild if you please ma'am father's killed the pig and mother thought you might like just a little piece of griskin and mother's been taking care of the mincer so it shan't get rusty an exchange of courtesies having been effected by means of a bottle of pear drops the small maid departed with her empty basket the mincer was restored to its proper niche in the pantry and we were at least one tea towel to the good i might mention that mrs widow's married daughter had recently acquired considerable local fame by making faggots which were in great demand you know the dish a combination of liver pork sage and onions etc baked in squares other people in the district made faggots too but none could rival hers and orders came to her from many of the big houses no one ever manages to get them chopped so beautifully fine as she does said miss bretherton when recommending them to my notice i advise you to try them still whatever obligation there may have been was offset surely by the piece of pork the griskin is the lean portion of some part of the quadruped's anatomy after the fat has been cut off for curing this joint which we never see in london is always popular with us in the country so popular that i had ordered a piece only the day before from the butcher it was just the season when people were killing their pigs and the butcher had suggested griskin still it was easy to put the extra piece in salt and the flavour would only be improved thereby my one regret was that the butcher had sent a very large joint when i had particularly mentioned that i only wanted a little piece i had originally intended to devote the day to gardening not to house-cleaning of course you keep a permanent gardener people inquire of me i see a general handyman it comes to the same thing he will save you all the trouble those of my acquaintances who have never had a place out of town to look after always conclude that country districts fairly bristle with capable willing men and poor but honest hard-working women all of them anxious to do my work and at a merely nominal wage too whereas one has the utmost trouble to get either man or woman to do a day's work at any price 
i pay the handyman the same wage per day as i pay my thoroughly experienced london gardener and he can only manage to spare me a small amount of his time at that price he knows very little about flowers but he weeds in an enlightened manner and he understands the elementary principles underlying vegetable growing on a small scale for the most part the villagers bother very little about their gardens only cultivating just sufficient ground for their immediate needs the unenlightened local method of dealing with weeds is this he who is paid to garden leaves them to grow to a fair height especially if no one is likely to be there for some weeks to see them then when they have absorbed a generous amount of nourishment from the ground and generally suffocated everything small within their reach he merely turns the soil over with the weeds on the underneath side draws a rake over the surface and presto you have a nice tidy bed this method is known as digging in of course in twenty-four hours the good-natured things start to poke cheerful noses through the soil again but that doesn't matter life is long and the gardener is paid to clear them away again there is an optional method referred to as cleaning up the beds in that case he leaves the weeds to grow higher more especially in beds that are full of promising seedlings in fact he doesn't worry about them at all until there is sudden and urgent reason why the garden should present a kempt well cared for appearance then the weeds being so healthy and luxuriant that they would raise the face of creation a couple of inches if he attempted to dig them in he simplifies matters by removing the surface of the earth weeds and seedlings and all this he wheels away in a barrow perchance to lay it down on some rough and rubbly bit of lane that the road menders have ignored when she who pays arrives all expectation and inquires for the missing seedlings the tiller of the soil shakes his head lugubriously and refers to the recent plague of slugs or thunderstorms or frost or east winds or whatever other natural phenomena seem most convincing and says he had a hard job to save what is left in the garden this last in a martyr-like tone of voice indicating that though all his self-sacrificing labour is passed over unrecognised he himself has the virtuous consciousness of having at least done his simple duty and what man can do more now i come to think of it there are many different ways of gardening that must be why it is always interesting to go round the garden with the gardener when i say different ways i don't mean such trifling divergencies of method as landscape gardens versus intensive culture or tomatoes under glass versus gloxinias these primarily concern the pocket the differences that interest me are temperamental there is miss bretherton for instance a most diligent and vigilant gardener and yet she never seems to me to get much genuine unalloyed pleasure out of her garden she never basks in its beauty though for the matter of that miss bretherton never basks anywhere a middle-aged woman who does her duty by a scattered parish conscientiously and thoroughly and unremittingly never has time for that sort of dissipation miss bretherton deals with her garden much as she deals with the parish at best it is a case of striving to lead reluctant feet in the paths of virtue while by far the greater part of her efforts is an unflagging wrestle with original sin a walk round the rectory garden is usually like this miss bretherton always picks up a pair of gardening scissors and a basket mechanically as she steps out what a wonderful glow of colour i exclaim as i bury my nose in a magnificent gloire de dijon but it is such a wretched thing for sending up suckers miss bretherton replies i'm always digging them up why i declare there is one a foot high giving it a drastic prod with the scissors i thought i'd cut them all away yesterday more prods till the sucker is finally unearthed and aren't those hollyhocks tall not nearly so fine as they would have been if that red spotty blight hadn't attacked them just look at those leaves snip 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 
off came a dozen or so i stopped to admire the fairy flowers in the virginia stock rosy carmine lemon and mauve just opening in the sun i don't think there's anything sweeter for a border i remark the trouble with virginia stock is that it so soon looks untidy miss bretherton says dispiritedly do what i will i can't keep the edges tidy once that goes off bloom i pull it all out at last and then that leaves a bare rough dried looking space with nothing in it i praise the white lilies such a stately row of spotless beauties i wish i could do something to hide that raggedness at the bottom of the stems they do look so shabby excuse me i see that canterbury bell is withered off that's the worst of them they all go at once so suddenly and look such a withered mass i must cut off those dead blooms it may send up a second crop but there if it does they will only be small bells i'm not sure whether the handyman's method is temperamental but i know it is very conversational if you can call it a conversation when he insists on doing the whole of it himself he is an elderly bachelor and mrs widow once explained the situation to me you see he ain't never had no wife to talk his head off for him so he talks it off for hisself i give him copious instructions whenever i leave which he promises to carry out but no matter what i may have asked him to do whether it was to nail up the yellow roses over the front door or to set lavender cuttings it all works out to the same thing in the end it is only the vegetables that are deemed worthy of mention the flowers are just tolerated because well because i keep on putting them in the ground and you can't expect practical common sense from a woman anyhow but after all it isn't reasonable to expect an untrained cottager to make a garden different from those he sees around you can understand however that we are usually kept pretty busy from the moment we arrive till the hour we go away but this particular morning gardening was out of the question the two girls started with the spring cleaning on most vigorous lines virginia said the hygienic way was to place everything that was movable out of doors so that scientifically speaking the sun's rays could penetrate every fibre and tissue and neutralize the harmful germs that would assuredly be lurking by the million in every stick and shred in a house as neglected as that one had been i objected to my cherished possessions being referred to as sticks and shreds and i said so with emphasis ursula said if we were going to argue at that length it would be the august bank holiday before we got things back in their place again for her part she regarded all that germ business as a harmless fairy tale that was very suitable and safe reading for a mild intellect like virginia's all the same she quite agreed that everything ought to be put outside so as to give more elbow room indoors moreover things that were washed and scrubbed would of course dry quicker in the sun so out they all came then we saw how badly the boards around the carpet needed restaining and we dispatched virginia to the village to see what she could get in the way of oak or walnut floor stain she returned with a large bottle of rheumatic lotion miss jarvis who keeps the village shop hadn't a bottle of stain left but virginia turned over everything she had and decided on the lotion as it was thickish and a nice rich brown she bore it off miss jarvis beseeching her to remember it was for outward application only it wasn't bad only it flavoured the air rather strongly for days ursula's labours were bearing much fruit to look at the scene outside the cottage you might have thought a distraint had been made on the contents for rent chairs tables meat safes crockery saucepans oak chests pictures books the warming pan brass candlesticks coal scuttles fenders were all basking unblushingly and in the direst confusion in the sunshine what pained me most was to notice how the furniture that had looked delightfully appropriate in the subdued lights of indoors became appallingly shabby when subjected to the glare of day i remarked that if i had confronted the things on a london burglar's barrow i should neither have recognized them nor have desired to claim them 
ursula tried to reassure me by reminding me that the things were mostly very old and antique things are invariably shabby as well as very valuable virginia contributed the consoling information that she had noticed whenever people moved they always left their good furniture behind in the empty house for they only removed shabby-looking things i tried to feel duly proud of my possessions once more but all the same i suggested that we should hurry on as fast as we could i had a strong conviction that if any of my county neighbours called they would probably be more impressed with the disreputable appearance of my belongings than with their priceless antiquity of course people came while we were still in chaos as i knew they would the first to arrive was miss primkins who apologized for calling at such an hour but she wanted to consult me on a private matter she was so very worried was i busy with an inquiring glance at the all-pervading marine store naturally i said i wasn't the difficulty was to find a seat indoors to accommodate us while we talked it wasn't warm enough as yet to sit in the open i found two chairs in the china pantry a fair-sized apartment with a big window even though it is called a pantry and here we established ourselves miss primkins reiterating how kind she thought it of me to receive her in this homely way treating her just like one of the family i tried to make her understand however that as a general rule it was not the family custom to foregather in the crockery cupboard she was a long while getting to the cause of her worry i wonder why it is that so many women when they start out to say anything wander about and deviate into innumerable side channels and backwaters before they get to the point but there i do myself so we won't follow up that line of thought eventually it transpired that when war was declared and the attendant moratorium miss primkins had hidden away what little gold she had in the bottom of a coffee canister with the coffee put in again artlessly on top since then she had added to her store of gold till at last she had twelve pounds in all on hearing this i scented the trouble and began to commiserate you don't mean to say someone has stolen it who could it have been oh no it hasn't been stolen though sometimes i almost wish but there i oughtn't to say that no the difficulty is that now i don't know how to get rid of it i never thought there was any harm in putting a little by in case anything happened till i saw in the papers that some one said lowering her voice that those who hoard gold are traitors to their country and in a still more shocked tone actually helping germany i've never had any such idea why it's the very last thing i should wish to do so i started unhoarding at once and took a sovereign when next i went out to pay my little grocery bill miss jarvis wasn't in the shop herself she wouldn't have been so rude but her assistant said well i never doesn't it seem odd to see a sovereign again i can't tell you when i saw one last i didn't know there was a solitary one left in the village wherever did you get it from miss primkins do you know i went hot and cold all over didn't know what to do with myself for fear she should guess i'd been hoarding and helping the country to be a traitor no i mean helping germany to be well you understand i just said quietly with all the composure i could muster i chanced to have it in my purse because after all it wasn't her business was it i agreed that it wasn't then i thought i should change half a sovereign that would be smaller and look less hoardingish at the station as i was going into chepstow to get some more wool for those socks for queen mary would you believe it the station master said you know his jocular way why miss primkins what bank have you been robbing i haven't had my hand crossed with gold i don't know when i'd like to keep it for myself for luck only the prime minister would be down on me for hoarding i suppose my knees shook so i could hardly get into the train 
i decided i wouldn't let anyone see another bit of it yet actually when i was in mrs davis's shop and getting out the money to pay for the wool if i didn't take out another half sovereign and mistake for a sixpence i was so unnerved i suppose and she said just fancy seeing a half sovereign again i thought they were all called in wherever did you light on that miss primkins now you can understand i'm at my wit's end to know what to do with that money i can't spend it without every one knowing if i put it in my savings bank book and so get it back to the government that way i have to hand it over the counter at the post office you know so much about business can you suggest anything i immediately offered to give the nervous worried lady treasury notes in exchange oh but i couldn't let you incriminate yourself like that she protested kind as it is of you there's your reputation as well as mine to be thought of i explained however that it was easier to dispose of an accusing golden sovereign in london without arousing the suspicions of the populace than it was in the country and i said i was sure my bank manager would oblige me by receiving the gold for the good of the country knowing me to be an honest and respectable englishwoman i never thought to be so thankful to see the last of a sovereign she said as she tucked the paper notes into her handbag i've scarcely slept all this week why germany is the very last thing i would help mrs widow came in at the gate as miss primkins went out and seeing the house all turned out of windows looked her surprise at such goings-on she carried a frying-pan a long-handled broom a double milk boiler an egg-beater and a lemon squeezer and explained that they had kept beautifully dry in her kitchen whereas they would have been ruined if left to get damp in an empty house parenthetically she hoped i would excuse her having used half a dozen lemons i had left in the pantry last time she was afraid they would not keep also some sugar in a tin that she dare say might have melted away and it seemed cruel to waste it considering the price of sugar of course i said she was quite welcome and by the way was i wanting a jar of lemon curd her daughter had made some that was really lovely and she would not mind obliging me by selling me a jar while she was describing the distinctive merits of the lemon curd and relating what the lady of the manor had said in praise of the jar she had purchased a man-servant arrived from the manor-house with a note and a basket which he handed to me with a very superior air that gave me to understand he was not in the habit of carrying baskets and was only doing so now as a patriotic act in war time across the kitchen table that stood in the path and blocked his further progress while i read the note he fixed his eyes upon his boots and apparently looked neither to the right hand nor to the left yet i know that he catalogued every item of those wretched domestic oddments that were decorating the lawn and garden path mrs widow possessed of a natural curiosity that is hard to circumvent was loath to leave without a glimpse of the contents of the basket but virginia got her off by escorting her to the gate and telling her that i had not been very well in town ah anybody could see that miss said mrs widow feelingly glancing in my direction don't she just look aggard and then seeing a look of surprise on the face of virginia who distinctly resented my being described as haggard she added hurriedly leastways i mean handsome haggard of course miss the lady of the manor had written to say that a cold was keeping her indoors for a day or two but in the meanwhile as they were busy curing bacon at the home farm she had had them cut just a little piece of griskin which she was sure i should like and was having it sent up at once etc the superior person left carrying in one hand an envelope addressed to his mistress which contained all the thanks i could muster and in the other a note to be left at the village shop asking miss jarvis 
to send me up a large block of salt what shall you do with all the pork ursula inquired i haven't the faintest idea i said i can't bestow any of it on the poor because no matter which piece i gave away mrs widow's married daughter would be sure it was her gift i had spurned and would feel duly slighted virginia broke in upon us breathlessly her arms full of pasteboard soup tureen hearth rug hassock and fire irons which she had hastily gathered up from the path the rector's outside in the lane talking to some children and has he any basket in his hand asked ursula no he only appears to be carrying his umbrella thank goodness said ursula fervently as she put the third flank of griskin in the coldest larder by this time the next caller was coming up the path and though i could invite him to take a seat in one of the armchairs that were now inside anything like order had not yet been evolved from the chaos the rector is loved by rich and poor alike by reason of his unselfishness his absolute sincerity and otherworldliness he is now well on in years but neither distance nor weather keeps him from visiting regularly all in his wide scattered parish his calls are always welcomed though i admit i should have preferred to see him any day other than the one in question i have come with a message from my niece he began she told me to say that she is sending up a small trifle a little housewifely notion of hers for your kind acceptance she thought you might find it add a little variety to the cottage menu as a matter of fact the rectory pig has gone the way of most pigs and we said the moment we heard you had arrived that we must get you to sample the home-grown article so she is sending you up just a little piece of ah here it is i expect as the rector's handyman came in at the gate carrying the inevitable basket and though the contents were wrapped up in a spotless white cloth there was no need for one to be told what he was bringing i tried to be as truly grateful as ever i could i told myself i must not think about the gift itself but must keep my mind focused on the kind thought that had prompted the gift nevertheless the basket seemed very heavy as i carried it into the larder and added one more joint to the goodly collection already assembled and as i went back into the living-room i heard virginia warbling outdoors not more than others i deserve but heaven has given me more there is something singularly exasperating about other people's joyousness when it is purchased at one's own expense we were restoring the last jug to its proper hook on the dresser when once more we saw miss primkins toiling up the steep garden path she really felt terribly ashamed to be intruding on me again but she had just read in the paper that the prime minister now said every one must save and no one who was a true patriot would spend more than was absolutely necessary now what was the difference between hoarding and saving she did so want to do the right thing it was so little she could do to help her country yet for the life of her she couldn't make out whether she ought to save that twelve pounds or spend it would i mind explaining it to her she never could understand anything prime ministers or people like that said nowadays so different from what it was in her young days when there was only lord salisbury and mr gladstone everything was so sensible and straightforward her father used to say always believe lord salisbury never believe mr gladstone or else it was the other way round she wasn't sure which whereas now what with radicals and coalitions and territorials and boards of this that and the other her brain almost gave way trying to find out who anybody was and when at last i think i've got it straightened out i find there's a lot of antis and it's just the opposite thing they say you ought or ought not to do or else you have to begin at the other end and work backwards what a lot those germans have to answer for i offered my own simple political creed for her guidance 
when the king or lord kitchener says anything then i know it's all right when they hold their tongues i know it's equally all right and the rest i don't worry about she said i had expressed her own views entirely only she never thought to put it so concisely as that what a wonderful thing it was to have a brain like mine that grasped things so clearly she should just go on being economical as her mother had always taught her to be until the king or possibly queen mary said anything definite on the subject then people would know where they were at least you aren't the only one bothered about the question of hoarding i said i'm also wrestling with the problem look here and i led the way to the larder and gave details i've been wondering whether as i relieved you of your hoard could you assist me out with mine will you accept a piece of griskin merely to get it off my premises miss primkins was almost tearful in her thanks it's so strange you should have thought to offer this she said in a sort of broken hesitation because i'm going to cardiff by the first train to-morrow to see my sisters i always like to take them a little something you understand they have big families and business is bad now and of course coming from the country only eggs are so dear and fowls such a price and just now well you know dividends aren't coming in as they did and i've my three houses standing empty and such a big bill for repairs and only of course rallying herself i'm heaps better off than those poor belgians but oh i can't tell you how grateful i am to you for your kindness you see i was keeping that twelve pounds by me in case i should be ill we never know do we or to meet the rent if i should run short please pardon my speaking of these things only you understand and the poor lady blushed to think she should have let herself refer to finances yes i understood rumour had already reached me that miss primkins had only used three hundred weight of coal through the whole of the winter of course in our village everybody knows how much everybody else buys of everything and she had been seen out in the woods gathering sticks she had cut her milk down to a half pint a day and that was consumed by rehoboam the cat she seldom had any meat and practised all sorts of pitiful little economies living chiefly on the vegetables she had grown in her garden but she never let anything interfere with the coin going into the sunday offertory or her knitting for the troops and she gave a donation to the red cross fund as gladly as any one it makes one's heart ache to think how many poor elderly ladies there are up and down the land who have lost what at best was but a very modest meed of comfort in the present financial upheaval and these have additional anxiety in the fact that it would be torture to them were their poverty paraded before the world they have not the physical strength to engage in national work though their spirits are valiant enough for any self-sacrifice so since it is all they can do for their country they shoulder their burdens uncomplainingly keeping a frail body alive on sugarless tea and sparsely buttered bread while they knit long long thoughts into socks and comforters if by any means they can raise the money to purchase the wool no fund is large enough to embrace such as these no charity could ever meet their case all the same they are part of the bulwark strength of england these dear faithful women who in old age and feeble health hide their own privations beneath a brave exterior willing to make any personal sacrifice rather than might should triumph of a right miss primkins i exclaimed when i heard of the cardiff visit i believe you're the good fairy who i used to think lived at the entrance to the waterfall cave under the hill and i'm certain you've been sent up here for the explicit purpose of relieving me of that meat if you're going to cardiff it's your clear duty to take a griskin to each of your sisters hardy eating boys did you say good that will rid me of two well you'll find them at the station in the morning waiting for the nine o'clock train we'll do them up to look like hot-house grapes and pineapples of course she protested but i remained firm as i told her i wasn't going to let slip such a heaven-sent opportunity to get those joints transported for life 
when virginia and ursula put them in the railway carriage next morning she asked if they would mind as they passed her house on their way home seeing if they could find rehoboam he hadn't come back for his milk and she couldn't wait for him they would find the door key under the fourth flower pot on the right-hand window sill and if he was waiting on the step his usual custom about half-past nine would they be so kind as to give him the milk that was in the larder then she need not worry any more about him they found rehoboam as per schedule and gave him the milk they couldn't help seeing that there was only a small piece of cold suet pudding a little blackberry jam and one thin slice of bacon in the larder when they got back we set to work on a cooking crusade and isn't there a delightful sense of freedom when you can do what you like in your own kitchen with no abigail oversighting your operations we cooked some griskin and made pastry and cakes and put some eggs into pickle do you know these hard-boiled eggs shelled when cold and put into pickle vinegar ready in a couple of days then when it got to within an hour of train time the girls went down and lit miss primkin's fire taking down a scuttle of coals for the purpose her outside coal cellar being locked fortunately gave us an excuse for not using up hers they also took some milk three of my finest potatoes and other things by the time the train arrived and miss primkin's was on a tired homeward walk the kettle was singing on the hob three floury potatoes strained but keeping hot in the saucepan stood beside the kettle the supper table was laid with cold griskin a jam tart and a small spice cake while in the larder stood two sausage rolls a seed cake and a jar containing three eggs in course of pickling of course the girls couldn't resist ticketing the things virginia made this so be cautious signed ursula and similar nonsense hoping thereby to divert miss primkins from the bald truth that is that we were trying to smuggle something into a bare cupboard then after rounding up rehoboam and placing him on the hearth-rug to give an air of social welcome they locked the door putting the key under the fourth flower-pot and skipped up the hill again by the woodland path as miss primkins turned in to her little garden gate End of section 14。section 15 a flower patch among the hills。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox.org。flower patch among the hills by flora clickman。when the surgeon crossed the hills。of course it seemed ridiculous for a sane and moderately well brought up individual to dress herself to go out and in a new hat too and then simply because her dog happened to tumble out of the window to collapse on the hearthrug like an anemic concertina while she draped her head gracefully over the fender with the plumes of the said new hat resting resignedly on the fire irons it didn't seem quite reasonable to want to go to sleep like that still as i showed signs of doing it once more after they had propped me upright again they decided to put me to bed when i woke up they told me i was ill that seemed ridiculous too and i said so and added that now i had had a little rest i intended to get up and go to town important appointment couldn't possibly be spared etc and they all said lots of things you know the kind of arguments your friends always bring to bear on you if you chance to be just a little out of sorts i tried to make them understand that i was indispensable to the well-being of london that though they might be in the habit of shirking work under the slightest pretext of a headache i wasn't that sort of a person i owed it to my conscience as well as to the world at large to be at work in my office within half an hour penning words of wisdom that should keep the universe on its proper balance ursula merely asked if i liked the milk with the beaten egg quite cold or a trifle warm in the end i had to give in they insisted i was ill and i admit i was feeling unusually tired but as the weeks went by i did not get as strong as i had hoped to do i seldom got farther than an easy chair and not always as far as that 
so at last I determined to try the cure that hitherto had never failed me. Trunks were packed, and they got me down by easy stages to the cottage among the hills. I felt that if only I could see the flowers and breathe the air that blows way over from where the lighthouse blinks in the channel, I should certainly pick up both my strength and my courage. When I reached the cottage, the autumn sun was setting on hills that were a gorgeous blaze of brilliant crimson, yellow, bright rust, gold, pale lemon, chestnut brown, with the dark green of yew trees at intervals. I have never seen colours like our autumn hillsides anywhere in the world, though, of course, they can be matched in places where the woods are made up of a wide variety of different trees. After the murk of London in October, the glory of it all fairly dazzled me. The garden was lovely, too, but in a wistful sort of way. Snapdragons and zinnias and eschultzias were blooming lustily. There were still blossoms on the monthly rose-bushes, nasturtiums flaunted in odd corners, and made splashes of brightness. The purple clematis over the porch was in full colour. Fusias, geraniums, belated larkspurs, hollyhocks, and sweet allison talked of summer not yet over, while peeping out from crevices among the stones and nestling at the roots of trees were primroses already in flower, violets were blooming in the big bed by the kitchen door, and the yellow jasmine was smothered in bloom, such a curious mixture of summer and spring overlapping, with no hint of autumn and winter in between. The fruit had not all been gathered in, and the trees in the orchard were bowed down with masses of crimson and pale green and golden yellow and russet brown, with spots of colour dotted about among the lush grass. It seemed impossible that one could remain ill in such an earthly paradise. I was too tired with the journey to go round the garden that day. I put it off till to-morrow. Next day I was not equal to going out at all, and the third day I did not get up. The colours gradually faded from the hillsides. The woods grew a purply brown. The white mists were later and later in rising from the river in the valley below me. All day long I lay in bed watching the sun move from east to west across the mountains, while near at hand tomtits and finches, jays and magpies, cheeky robins and green and crimson woodpeckers flitted about in the bare trees just outside my windows. One little wren used regularly to pay me a morning call on the window ledge. Often she flew right into the room. I liked to think she came to ask how I was. Once I opened my eyes to find a robin perched on the rail at the bottom of the bed, eyeing me inquiringly. The little wild things on these hills seemed so friendly. As soon as twilight fell, the owls woke up the adjoining wood, and called to other owls across the ravine. These were the only sounds to break the silence. It is when you are ill, more than at any other time, that you realise the human difference between town and country. You can live all your life, and then be ill and die, in London, and the people next door, even those in the same building, may know nothing about it. I knew of a girl living in a block of small flats occupied by women workers, and trying to make a living by journalism, who lay dead in her room for a week, and then was only discovered by the caretaker because her rent was overdue. No one had missed her, though there were women going up and down stairs and in and out of the rooms all around her. The isolation of the solitary woman in a crowded city can be something awful. It isn't that town-dwellers at heart are more selfish than country folks. It is their mode of life that is to blame. London claims so much of one's time and energy for the doing of most important work and the pursuit of machine-made pleasure, till next to nothing is left for the greatest of all work and the greatest of all pleasure, merely being kind. Once it was known that I wasn't getting better, and the local doctor had been summoned, he lived in another village nearly four miles off, kindnesses came from all directions, everybody offering the best they had. If extra people had been required to take turns sitting up at night, any number were ready to come on duty. One woman, who is exceedingly capable, though an amateur masseuse, came to inquire if it was a case where robbing would be beneficial. She brought a bottle of elements with her, in case she could be of use, and offered to come daily. Did the buff Orpingtons lay that priceless treasure an unexpected midwinter egg? 
it was promptly sent up by a small child with a kind hope from a mother that the lady would be able to take it i believe sarah ann perkins would have slain every duck she possessed and have scorned to take payment if only there had been the slightest chance of my once more eating that fair slice from the breast a calf's foot was needed for jelly the butcher hadn't one didn't know who had but one arrived next day though he had to scour the county for it was anything required hurriedly from the village shop everybody was willing to go and fetch it or miss jarvis would toil up with it herself after the shop was closed rather than i should be kept waiting bringing up a bunch of early violets from her garden at the same time one farmer's wife trailed up the rough wet paths with a little pigeon all ready for roasting in the hope that it might tempt me the handyman went out and shot an owl because he was sure i must find all they hooters a terrible nuisance of course he didn't know how i loved the owls nor how companionable it seemed to hear them calling to one another through the long long night but probably the kind thought behind his gun was of greater worth than the bird he shot yes everybody was anxious to do something only there was so little they could do till one day angelina lost herself she had followed abigail in the afternoon to the village where a dog suddenly scared and chased her and she flew off into the woods abigail hunted for her till the winter dusk settled in but no cat responded to her calls so she had to content herself with mentioning the matter at each cottage in the vicinity every one willingly undertaking to keep a lookout for the missing cat by the next afternoon every youngster in the village was out scouting for her and saucers of milk were placed enticingly outside doors but poor angie was never seen again i missed her very much she was only a very ordinary tabby but she was a large comfortable homely sort of a cat and she had made it part of her daily programme to come upstairs and jump softly on my bed with a pleased little mew and then settle herself down beside me where i could reach out my hand to stroke her while she purred soothingly the whole time the little dog was too boisterously demonstrative in his joy at seeing me to be allowed in the room but the more sedate and gentle angelina helped me to pass many a weary hour when all search for her proved fruitless the kindly village people didn't dismiss the matter as done with forthwith they started a procession from the village to my house and about every hour some one arrived with an offering i could hear their voices at the door below through the open bedroom window first it was a labouring man with a big hamper my missus is so worried about the poor young lady losing her cat so i brought up our tom if she cared to accept him he's a fast cast ratter killed a bigger in our barn yesterday etc then it was the piping voice of a small girl accompanied by two smaller please we're so sorry about the lady not having a pussy when she's poorly and we've brought her our two little kitties and one has six toes next a bigger girl gran says would miss like one of our kittens they'll be able to leave their mother next week and i'll bring the lot up for her to choose from if she'd like one a boy arrived with a basket containing a fine black cat mother sent this for the lady just you see how he'll jump over my hand and stand on his hind legs a wild scramble followed here peter here come back peter puss puss there now i've done it mother said i wasn't to open the basket till i was inside the house i spect he's gone back home again by now but i'll bring him up again presently the lady'll love to have him he's so knowing later i heard a woman's voice oh dear soul it do seem hard and the only cat she've got too well we've got six to our house and she can have all on em and welcome as virginia said it was not quite so embarrassing as griskin's because at least each had four legs with which to get itself off home again but it was weary work lying still day after day till the weeks actually lengthened into months i kept on telling myself i was making headway but it was a poor pretence i gave up thinking about it at last and wondered how i could best endure the pain that no one seemed able to relieve the autumn had now changed to winter and one morning i woke to see snow bearing down the fir trees and lying on the hills 
the snow is very beautiful when one is well and strong and able to go out in the crisp cold air and enjoy it but to me penned in among the hills miles away from town and the advantages of up-to-date civilization it gave a sudden sense of desolation it shut me off most effectually from the big world i wanted so badly to see again as i looked out upon that snow it seemed as though i were buried already one desire swamped all others and that was the longing to get back to london where friends would be around me and specialists within easy reach and yet that appeared to be an utter impossibility it has always been a matter of pride with me that my cottage is situated in one of the most inaccessible spots in the british isles i used to feel so happy in the thought that it was only with the most utmost difficulty that a vehicle could be got near the garden gate it gave me such a sense of seclusion and delightful far awayness after the crush and hustle of town life but for once i wished i had been a wee bit more accessible i realized that there might be certain advantages in having a good county road close by whereon a helpless invalid could be driven to the station without having every bone in her body jolted to pieces but it was too late to do anything now altogether it was two months before i let anyone in town know how ill i really was most people thought i was merely taking a long rest naturally it was at once suggested a specialist should be sent for but i said no i was such a weak creature by this time i felt i couldn't bear to hear the worst i was almost sure there would be a worst to hear and that a specialist wouldn't diagnose my illness as merely overwork i insisted that i would rather be left to die quietly i know it sounds very cowardly and i was a coward at the time but i think many women will understand this condition of mind we do try so often to push back with both hands trouble of this sort when we dimly see it ahead the hale and hearty person will naturally exclaim how perfectly ridiculous how much more sensible to have proper advice and then set to work to get strong again i know i have myself said this sort of thing to ill people many a time in the past but i learnt a lot of things during that breakdown among them that it is very easy to lay down the law as to what should be done and to act in a common-sense manner when one is well but it is quite another thing to follow one's own good advice or in fact do anything one ought to do when one is too weak even to think yet how often it happens that in our direst extremity help comes when least expected so soon as it became known in town that i was really seriously ill there appeared among my morning letters a note from one of london's most famous surgeons saying that he was coming down on a friendly visit in a couple of days just to see if i can help you at all i read the letter a second time and then all my fears vanished someone coming to help me seemed so different from a formal consultation that phrase was better than reams of ordinary sympathy or kind inquiries or professional expressions and then i felt so glad that the matter had been taken out of my hands it seemed as though a weight was lifted from my brain and being a feeble as well as a foolish creature at first i put my head under the eiderdown and had a weep for sheer gratitude but a few minutes later i rubbed my eyes and felt i was heaps better already yet the way was not entirely clear even though this busy overworked specialist was offering to spend more than a day in journeying across england to the far-off cottage there was the snow to be reckoned with and when it likes the snow on our hills can frustrate anybody's best laid plans the sky was very grey i did hope no more would fall otherwise the roads would probably be impassable owing to the scarcity of trains in our valley the local doctor was to tap the main line some miles away and meet the great surgeon and a rich resident was kindly loaning a cherished new car as the doctor did not consider either of his own motors worthy of the occasion but even he was dubious as he looked at the heavy skies he said he could manage to get the car through eighteen inches of snow but if it were deeper than that i remembered that only a couple of years before i had been snowed up in the cottage with drifts six foot deep the outlook wasn't exactly encouraging such heaps of tragedies seemed possible within the next twenty-four hours suppose for instance royalty should suddenly develop some malady necessitating arms or legs being amputated without delay i simply dared not think about such a calamity 
and even though the specialist escaped a royal command and actually set off to catch his train that was to bring him to our hill country there might be an accident london streets are beset with terrors i never realized till that moment how many dangers a man must face between wimpole street and paddington station but i tried to have faith that all would be well i heard a soft step in the room every step that came near me was softened nowadays i opened my eyes and saw abigail beside my bed please do you happen to know if the specialist doctor takes pepper she asked in the half whisper that she had adopted as her bedroom voice i haven't the remotest idea i said but why do you want to know because we've just smashed the glass pepper box and we haven't another down here and i can't exactly put it on the table in a mustard pot i watched for the snow the eighteen inches i was dreading but the wind changed and it didn't fall instead next morning found us enveloped in a solid fog the only fog we had had this season hills and valleys were blotted out as completely as though they had never existed the cottage seemed to stand in mid-air with nothing but grey unoccupied space around it and it was such a raw penetrating fog i just lay and watched the grey blind world outside the windows and counted the half hours as the morning wore by and isn't it amazing how long the very minutes can be when one is right down ill and waiting for a doctor in a small isolated community like ours one excitement is made to do duty for a long time the impending visit of the surgeon from london was soon the topic of general conversation and little white curtains were pulled aside from cottage windows as the car with the doctor and a stranger was seen coming down one hill and over the bridge into the village in the valley switchbacking again up the opposite hill to reach the particular crag on which my cottage is perched owing to previous heavy rains the lanes were almost impassable in places overflowing brooks made rivers and swamps in most unexpected spots thus it was that the car could not come within half a mile of the cottage it had to be beached high and dry in somebody's farmyard and the rest of the journey made on foot the walk is a positive fairyland dream in summer but on the bleak december day the ferns and flowers were gone and the withered grass stalks rustled with a disconsolate wheeze while the pine trees creaked and moaned in the wind it seemed an unkind inhospitable sort of a day to bring a busy valuable man such a long cold distance at last i heard brisk footsteps coming down the path to the door scrunching the cones that had fallen from the larches then a cheerful voice was speaking while greatcoats were being taken off down below i shut my eyes and felt i need not worry any more after all we women are curious creatures we consult a specialist when we have some weakness that won't give way to ordinary treatment and then when out of his exceptional knowledge and wide experience he tells us what will probably cure us many of us immediately beseech him to make it something else when the surgeon told me what course it would be necessary to take if i was to be got on my feet again i immediately began to state a hundred reasons why i wished he would prescribe something entirely different he said he was going to have me brought to london at once and taken to a hospital i knew that was the very last thing i could endure i have always had an absolute terror lest i should ever have to go into a hospital and here i was confronted with it face to face i said i could not go into one whatever treatment was necessary must be done in my own home i didn't want to be among strangers and with nurses whom i had never seen before i wanted to be nursed by people i knew and as for chloroform well i would gladly die first such was the horror i had of it and i continued on these lines the surgeon listened very patiently and let me have my say out where in the world does a man like this get his marvellous stock of patience from he even agreed with most of my arguments anaesthetics were disagreeable it certainly would be pleasanter to be in my own home and it might be nicer if i had only friends around me etc but all the same it was borne in upon me that i might as well try to get the sphinx to turn its head and nod over to a pyramid as to attempt to make the man who was talking to me budge an eighth of an inch and he wound up by saying i am afraid however that it will have to be a hospital i am so sorry but i want you to go into a private ward at mildmay 
you shall have the best man in london to administer the anaesthetic and as for nurses if you don't say they are some of the finest women you have ever met i shall be much surprised by this time i had my head under the eider-down again and was howling away quietly i was so truly sorry for myself the great man waited for a minute and then as the sniffles didn't stop he said now just listen to me you are in the habit of writing heaps of good advice to people when they are in trouble telling them to have faith when adversity comes and to bear their burdens bravely don't you think you are a most inconsistent person here you are confronted with something that is going to be a trifle trying and you immediately turn your face to the wall and say you prefer to die without so much as giving a solitary kick why hezekiah isn't in it beside you what is your faith worth at this rate then for a good half hour he sat and talked reminding me of our duty as professing christians of the wrong we do when we try to shuffle away from our work of god's care for his children individually and of our foolishness in doubting him in times of trouble i had got to a very low ebb spiritually as well as physically being cut off from the world and so much alone with only a pain to think about my outlook on life had become altogether distorted my soul was certainly in need of bracing up just then and it got it one thing impressed me very much at this time that is the marvellous power that lies in the hands of those who can bring healing to the soul as well as healing to the body the most devout of god's ministers have seldom such power as this they can bring messages of hope and consolation but they do not know how much a sick person is able physically to stand in the way of a strong spiritual tonic and they seldom dare administer one even though they may think it necessary but the doctor knows how much the patient is equal to and the man who has consecrated to god's service a life that is spent in mending the poor broken bodies of humanity is surely doing work that angels might envy undoubtedly god gives him power and opportunity that falls to the lot of few other men the december afternoon closed in early and the surgeon had once more to take a long dreary journey to get back to the urgent work waiting for him in town but he left behind him a far more sane and sensible person than he had found on his arrival when he had gone after having made the most comprehensive and detailed plans for my removal abigail tiptoed into my room her face all aglow with excitement i thought you'd like to know i heard the specialist doctor say when i was bringing in the sweets at lunch that he didn't know when he had eaten roast chicken he had enjoyed so much i shall rub it in to cook when we go home and i'd better let sarah ann perkins know as we got it from her take whatever is left and keep it for a souvenir i said and if you like to have the carcass framed i'll pay for it you look better already she replied thus the great man scattered cheeriness in various directions and sarah ann a year later pridefully showed me the chicken's wings atop her best sunday bonnet in just as much time as it took my london doctor to come west to assume charge of me they got me under way but how am i ever going to reach the main road i wailed perfectly easy said ursula you are going to be carried and every masculine in the place is willing to lend a hand and so they did one young man made himself entirely responsible for my luggage going off with it by train that there should be no chance of any delay a stalwart fisherman and a sturdy young farmer carried me in a chair straight up hill for half a mile to where a motor was waiting on the county road everybody was so gentle and quiet and yet very businesslike they stood silently with their hats off while i was put into the car i looked round on the hills convinced that i was looking at them for the last time and felt exactly as though i were present at my own funeral even the people in the village kept sympathetically in the background with the same sort of respect one observes when a funeral procession passes though at the last house in the village one dear kindly soul pulled her little white curtains aside waving her hand and smiling encouragingly to me as we went by End of section 15section 16 of flower patch among the hills this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
recording by kathleen flower patch among the hills by flora glickman in mild may hospital an interlude i don't think there is anything worse than the sense of utter desolation that envelops you when the hospital door finally closes on everybody you know and you are alone with total strangers and unknown terrors ahead the dreariest moment of my whole life was when i found myself alone in a private ward at mildmay with no one whom i knew within call yet was it mere chance i wonder that the nurses at their prayers that day sang matheson's beautiful hymn o oh, love that wilt not let me go it came to me along the corridor as i lay staring at the ceiling i tried in my heart to sing it with them but i gave it up when they got to the verse o oh, joy that seekest me through pain i cannot close my heart to thee i trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be i couldn't see the rainbow just then nevertheless i got to love that room as one of the happiest spots on earth for the sake of the people whom i found there and during the ten weeks i remained in it i proved beyond all chance of further doubt that when god seems to be taking from us he is in reality giving us something better than all we could ever ask or think at the moment of the taking perhaps our eyes are too dim to see this but in the fulfilment of time when he wipes away our tears may it not be that in addition to banishing our sorrows he will clear our vision that we may see how marvellously he made all things work together for good next day i remarked irritably that i didn't like the green walls and i thought the green bedspread positively bilious the matron looking at me with a twinkle in her eyes said dear lady you shall have another bedspread this instant and as soon as you are well enough to be moved we will repaint the walls whatever color meets with your approval we can't do it while you are in bed can we meanwhile i shall call you delicate fuss and delicate fuss i have remained ever since but there was such an amount of misery bottled up inside me some of it was obliged to spill over and i once more reiterated my desire to die that's all right said the matron cheerfully but how about your tombstone you would like a really artistic one wouldn't you and being literary surely you would wish to edit what is to go on it now let us see what we can scheme out so we all settled to a discussion of shapes and styles and suitable words the nurses warmed to the work the ward sister came in to give her views and for the first time for weeks i found myself smiling finally it was unanimously decided that the most appropriate and truthful description would be these simple words she was plain but occasionally pleasant but the time came when i was beyond even discussing tombstones when i could not bear a sound in the room and even quiet footsteps jarred me then it was that i found out more especially what the spirit of mild may stands for it was no mere perfunctory service that was rendered the invalid doctors matron nurses said nothing of the extra hours of work they put in on my account of the watching and tending when they were really supposed to be off duty it seemed wonderful that i who had looked forward to the inevitable with a terrible dread of being lonely and among strangers should actually find myself when the time came surrounded by friendly faces and cared for by people who had grown very dear to me and fancy a hospital where they went to the trouble of bandaging up the door handles to prevent noisy bangs where they laid down matting to deaden the sounds in the corridor where they fixed peremptory notices to the doors enjoining all and sundry to close them quietly where even the ward maid constituted herself dragoness in chief for the time being watching and waiting and then pouncing on any unthinking person who might let a latch slip through her fingers or a house porter who might clatter a coal scuttle yet this and a great deal more is what they did at mild may just because one patient was going through a bad time thanks to all the care i received i was at last able to leave the hospital of course i was glad to go out into the big world again who wouldn't be 
after lying all that time with no other view visible from where i lay but three chimney-pots i was glad to think i was going to be able to walk again and take up my work once more but i felt genuine regret at having to say good-bye to the people i had really grown to love during my stay with them i shall never forget the morning that i was taken away by a couple of nurses to the seaside the others came in ones and twos to say good-bye and in the midst of it the great surgeon walked in just to see what the patient was like before she started now confess he said a hospital isn't such a bad place after all is it i agreed with him but i couldn't put into words what a wonderfully good place i had found it i could only think what a contrast was presented between the poor forlorn thing who arrived three months before and the still very wobbly but cheerfully smiling person who was now driving away while the nurses leaned out of the upper windows and showered rice all over the vehicle End of section sixteen. Section 17 of Flower Patch Among the Hills. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Flower Patch Among the Hills by Flora Glickman. The Return to the Flower Patch. And because it is the correct thing to introduce a wedding into the last chapter, I had better mention the one I know most about i always did say that whenever i married my wedding should be characterized by everything appertaining to common sense while all the feebleness and foolishness and weak-mindedness i had noticed at other people's weddings would be entirely lacking i have often remarked how strange it is that otherwise sensible people seem to lose all idea of proportion when it comes to arranging a wedding how they let themselves be obsessed with clothes and furniture and wedding presents that they don't require or if they do require them they might have been dealt with on orderly systematic lines why need there be a chaos of garments in the spare room and every wardrobe and chest of drawers in the house just because one person is going to be married i have said many a time well i'm not going to say it again in fact the older i get the more i find life resolves itself into one continual discovery that i needn't have said half the things that i did say in my first youth but with regard to the wedding i think i started all right it was as matters proceeded that i was overtaken by the inevitable i really was too busy with arrears of work that accumulated during my long illness to see to the trousseau details in extenso so i asked an intimate friend if she would take this in hand for me which she kindly agreed to do she had had lots of experience and her taste was exquisite so i knew matters were safe with her she asked me what frocks i already had i replied not a rag fit to wear then i'll make a good selection and have them sent home for you to choose from she replied her face suffused with that joy radiance that invariably overtakes a woman who starts out shopping with a blank check in her handbag she certainly did make a good selection i almost wished it hadn't been quite so good then at least i should have known what to send back but as it was every fresh box i opened i exclaimed isn't that lovely i must have that till presently the room was a billowy sea of tissue paper and beautiful garments that looked as though hands had never touched them i thought i was quite hardened and proof against lures of this kind but the snare of it simply enmeshes you before you know where you are as my bedroom was soon full to overflowing i said the rest of the things had better go into a spare room very soon the spare rooms were full too and so we went on like that why didn't i put the things away in drawers and wardrobes simply because every receptacle i possessed was full to distraction before the trousseau things started to arrive did you ever know a woman who possessed a drawer or a wardrobe peg that wasn't already over full and she pining for more space so for weeks we had to hop over piles of cardboard boxes no matter what room we entered and scrabble up more bales of tissue paper and things to make room on the sofa for the friend who called to bring her good wishes in person 
still i have always thought that a strong argument in favor of a woman getting married is the fact that she presumably comes in for additional drawers and wardrobes hence i looked forward to getting into my new home with considerable satisfaction in view of the purchase of extra furniture yes i know it's a bit crowded just now i agreed when virginia suggested i should set up a shop with modes at robes over the door because she had estimated that i shouldn't need to buy any tissue paper for eleven years and five months but i shall have heaps of spare room when i get into the new house i really shan't know what to do with so many chests of drawers but alas in spite of the additional furniture i am still squeezing things into drawers that would be so much more useful if made of elastic india rubber instead of wood and i am still flattening garments into wardrobes that are so bulgingly full that i wonder sometimes whether the looking-glass will stand the inside pressure and still i don't seem to have a rag fit to wear but the moving process was even worse than the trousseau the very thought of it was turning my brain to stone when i mentioned my quakings about the moving to the head of affairs he said airily don't you give a solitary thought to that just go away for a couple of days holiday and when you come back you will find everything as right as can be in the new house you don't need to touch a thing or pack an atom the men do everything now why bother your head with unnecessary worrying and so forth i seemed to think i had heard the same remark made in the dim past when we removed from one house to another in my early days i also remember that the brother of virginia and ursula said the very same thing to them when they moved and they acting on masculine advice had the greatest difficulty ultimately in ever finding any solitary thing they possessed including themselves among the ruins so i decided to postpone the couple of days holiday and face the worst there is no need to go into details about that move those who have been through it know exactly how many months it takes to find such things as the corkscrew the button hook the oil can belonging to the sewing machine the one hammer that has its head fixed on firmly they know the joy with which you fall on the missing sofa cushions when they are eventually discovered done up with spare bedding in the attic that every one has been too tired to undo and the affectionate greetings bestowed on the hall clothes brush when it is at length found in company with the dog's whip in a drawer one has forgotten in a small table of course it's very satisfactory when the perspiring gentleman who has packed and then unpacked again all the china comes to announce not a single piece is cracked or chipped madam but when you survey the piles of crockery and glass on the kitchen dresser and table and window ledge and mantelpiece that haven't yet found an abiding place and see the pantries full to overflowing a lurking thought comes that perhaps it might have been an advantage if he had smashed a few dozen of the multitudinous array of cups and saucers and plates and dishes that seem woefully superfluous at the moment as there seemed a good bit still to do i said i would dispense with the conventional tour proper to the occasion and spend the time trying to dispose of twenty-seven british workmen supposed to be house decorating who were cheerfully in possession and apparently regarding their posts as life appointments when our goods arrived at the door despite our having let them live in the house rent-free for two months previously it was a little difficult to follow their twenty-seven lines of argument as to why they should remain with us permanently with abigail continually at my elbow presenting a tradesman's card and explaining please ma'am this man says he served the people who were here before but i've told him he's the ninth fishmonger who has said that to-day or else it would be there's a man at the door says he's served the last people with groceries can i tell him to run back and get some soap i can't find where the men put our packets and it will be quicker than sending to the stores i suppose you don't happen to have it hmm cook and i have looked everywhere but we found the anchovy sauce and the carpet beater where do you think they had packed them and so on but i determined to do my wifely duty in making a happy home for the man who had had the courage to marry me 
i was politely attentive when interviewed by a near-by magnate who was anxious to propose the head of affairs for the conservative club i accepted particulars supplied me by the secretary of the golf club who felt we were the very people the club needed i tried to understand when the gardener explained the peculiarities of the greenhouse heating apparatus and the danger that would threaten if any one but himself entered the greenhouse i endured the postman knocking at the door a dozen times a day to inquire if we lived there only to point out to us that we didn't when we had assured him that we did i informed the sweep that everything was quite satisfactory thank you and i should hope to have the pleasure of meeting him again i accepted the coal man's many reasons for not having delivered the coal sooner and i thanked cook for the information that the policeman said he or his mate would always be on point duty at the corner whenever we wanted him i filed half a bushel of tradesmen's price lists and laundry data i put the whole household on a milk pudding diet rather than waste the numerous samples of milk left by rival and mutually abusive dairymen in a row of cans at the side door and when a sumptuously apparelled resident called to say that the previous occupant had always contributed liberally to the local working men's brass band i tried to look gratified to hear of such generosity though i had the presence of mind to say that i should not be at home on saturday evening when they proposed to serenade me in the front garden yes it was a pleasant and peaceful couple of days and i dare say i should have been all the better for the complete rest had not the telephone men and the gas stove men called simultaneously with the electrical engineers who had been summoned to see why the electric light sulked and with a unanimity of purpose that was truly beautiful in a world so full of variance they all set to work to take up floorboards in rooms and halls where the carpets and lino had been laid the twenty-seven standing around and assisting with reminiscence and anecdote then it was that the head of affairs put down a firm foot and insisted on the flower patch at first abigail was reluctant to leave such bright scenes in the kitchen as she hadn't known for several years but remembering that a halo of distinction surrounds the bearer of exclusive information no matter how unimportant she set off cheerfully next morning and we followed a day later she prided herself on the tactful way she broke her news to the village hasn't miss glickman come down long with e inquired mrs widow and the handyman in unison you'll never see miss glickman again abigail replied in funeral tones oh you don't tell me so poor dear thing though i knowed she wasn't long for this world and kind-hearted mrs widow started to mop her eyes with her apron was it very sudden at the last very said the handmaiden couldn't make up her mind till the very day before the wedding when they had grasped the true state of affairs and imbibed enough particulars to have filled three newspaper columns mrs widow hurried off home and then on to the village likewise conscious of the halo of distinction but the handyman paused i'd wish i'd er knowed a bit sooner he said then i'd er made an arch with welcome on it as large as you please yes i'd er like to have had an arch but thur after a moment's thought perhaps i'd better do a bit o weedin and cut the grass thus it happened that i was once again going along the road over which they had carried me only seven months before it was cold and cheerless then now it was all flowers and sunshine the kindly motherly soul who lives in the end house was at her gate now watching for our coming well there well there as the wagonette stopped for me to speak to her i thought i should never see you again and she grasped my hand in her own having first polished it on her apron which is always fresh and spotless and now here you are my dear i'm that glad to see you back and i do hope you'll be happy the stalwart fisherman setting on the river bank raised his cap i hadn't forgotten the good work he had done for me miss jarvis at the village shop came to the door and waved her hand i remembered the box of violets and moss and little ferns she had posted to the hospital in the cottage itself kind hands had been hard at work 
it was simply a bower of wild flowers the walls inside were nearly smothered with trophies of moon daisies grasses and ferns and the same scheme of flowers was carried all up the stairs on the window ledge on the landing were bowls of sweet betsy and cow parsley and such a pretty mixture the crimson and the white flowers made upstairs the rooms were gay with bowls of forget-me-nots and buttercups downstairs it was wild roses and honeysuckle with mugs of red clover on the mantelpieces being summer the fire grates were at liberty and these were filled with branches of bracken ivy silvery honesty seeds and foxglove everything had such a delightfully misty effect by reason of the seeding grasses that had been added lavishly to the flowers the only garden flowers in the house were some roses in the centre of the dinner-table sent by miss jarvis with some pale green young lettuces from her garden outside the swallows were twittering and like all the other birds were fussing about their small families the distant hills were glowing crimson by the acre where the timber had been cut i knew it was myriads and myriads of foxgloves near at hand the flower patch was a mass of nodding blossoms coupled with a choice variety of weeds i wondered where i had better begin and how i should cope with the bindweed flaunting itself everywhere that it had no business to be had i better start with the handyman on it at once or would it be better to set him to cut the hedges but even as i was planning out a good week's work for him i saw him coming up the path a picturesque figure in a blue jersey a large shady rush hat and carrying as signs of office a pitchfork a scythe and a rake and i heard his voice in the garden speaking to the head of affairs good day to ye sir i'm main glad to see ye for i calker late as how in future i takes my orders from the master end of section seventeen end of flower patch among the hills by flora glickman